Since 2007, the UK economy has experienced a much lower growth rate and a relative decline compared to its main competitors. Before the crisis, the UK growth rate was around 2.5% a year, but since then that has fallen to around 1.5%. But even more concerningly, it's a very low growth in median wages for the average worker. And you can see here how UK wage growth has significantly lagged behind many of our main international competitors. So what is causing this relative decline in both growth and wages compared to other countries? Well, let's go back to the 1980s. In the early 80s, the UK economy was in dire straits with high inflation, poor industrial relations, and a similar story of low growth. And the incoming Conservative government increased interest rates, pursued tighter fiscal policy, tried to reduce budget deficits, and this brought inflation down, but at the expense of a very deep recession. Around 30% of UK manufacturing output was lost. Now, it wasn't just due to the monetarist policies of the early 80s. I think it's also fair to say there had been a post-war malaise in British industry with poor industrial relations, low investment and low take-up of new technology. A similar story to actually uh, what we have now. But anyway, the point is that manufacturing output fell quite significantly. And then in the mid-1980s, the Conservative government introduced the Financial Service Deregulation Act, also known as the Big Bang. And this deregulated and liberalised financial services. So banks were really free to do what they liked in terms of financial instruments. And for quite a few years, this helped the UK economy gain more tax revenues. But the problem is that in 2007, when the great financial crisis hit, the UK economy was very hard hit because we were very reliant on financial services and the tax revenue that they created. So you can see here how the pound fell by around 30% in 2007, 2008, as the markets downgraded the UK prospects because of the credit crunch and the financial crisis. But as you can see, it wasn't just financial services that were in recession. Manufacturing output fell significantly and struggled to recover in the following years. As a result of the recession and falling tax revenue from financial services, the UK budget deficit soared. Now, as a result of this, as a result of a high borrowing, the incoming Conservative government of 2010 pursued a policy of austerity. They argued it was necessary to reduce budget deficits and cut spending. And so this led to a period of falling public sector investment and low growth. And it's a cycle of austerity, low growth and low investment that has characterised the economy in the past 10 or 15 years. And you can see here how total investment as a share of GDP in the UK is only around 18%, which is quite significantly lower than many of our other competitors. Another example of the low investment of the UK economy is if we look at research and development. And here, UK invests only around 1.5% of GDP in research and development, which is significantly lower than other countries such as Germany and the United States. The CBI have been quite concerned about the relative decline of the UK economy, and they have instituted quite a few studies. And as well as low investment, they also highlight how the UK has a low take-up of new technologies, such as robots and artificial intelligence. The UK stands only 24th in a global table of robot use, which indicates the reliance on labour-intensive methods of production. And this is perhaps one factor behind the low wage growth. With low take-up of new technology, firms are relying on cheap labour to try to get the job done. Another big factor that affects the long-term performance of the economy is the level of education and training. And the UK has often suffered from a lack of vocational training. Even in the 1980s, only around 40% of school leavers from the UK had vocational training, which compared to around 80 or 90% for France or Germany. And this gap in vocational training has never really been uh, solved. The austerity of the 2010s often fell on education. It was not one of the protected budgets. And the CBI estimate that around 90% of the British workforce are in need of training, 
which would cost around £17 billion to fix. But the money is unlikely to be there as we enter perhaps a new era of austerity 2.0. So the lack of skills and dynamism in the workforce is a problem. But as well as the lack of skills and training, firms are reporting difficulties in filling vacancies. You could say one of the strengths of the UK economy in the recent years is low unemployment. But the flip side of that is that some firms are struggling to fill vacancies. And with Brexit and an ageing population, this problem might get worse as the uh, labour force increases less than expected. And like many countries, the UK has been hit by an ageing population, which has reduced the labour force, with many people retiring early, some due to ill health, some just because they can. One striking uh, fact I'd like to throw in here is if you look at pension spending as a share of GDP, it's really increased quite dramatically. And this reflects an important feature of the UK economy, that whilst workers have experienced a lot of real wage declines or stagnant real wages, we are more generous to our state pensions. There's a triple lock guarantee for state pensions. And I have nothing against pensioners, you know, I'll be one fairly soon and my parents are pensioners. But it does reflect a political reality that there's a greater political pressure to increase pensions generously than there is to increase, say, benefits for working people or protect uh, public sector pay. And this um, is a political decision. But from an economic point of view, uh, the increase in pension spending as a share of GDP does have an economic impact because it's perhaps encouraging early retirement. Uh, it's resources that we can't spend to improve the economic uh, productivity. Now, actually, the UK situation is better than many other countries. Many countries like South Korea, Italy, Japan have a rapidly declining birth rate and falling population. The UK is actually doing better in that respect. The population has been increasing because of net migration and also a slightly higher birth rate. So despite this population advantage, uh, the UK economy is still doing badly. Now, on top of all these long term structural problems, such as low investment, poor education, uh, poor research and development, in 2016, we had a vote to leave the European Union. And this caused a 16% fall in sterling. And the reason was that markets were worried that outside the European Union, the UK economy would struggle. And the subsequent decision to go for a hard Brexit, leave the single market, leave the customs union, is perhaps the worst possible outcome from an economic perspective. It's led to a big increase in trade frictions and a big fall in trade with the European Union, our main trading partner. And you can see here how after the COVID pandemic, uh, the trade density in the UK has fallen behind our competitors and exports to Europe have fallen by around 16%. Some studies have suggested that the UK GDP is around 4% lower than it would have been if it stayed in the single market. Now, I'm not going to go into all the detail of Brexit because recently I published a video on the costs of Brexit and why they keep growing. But suffice to say that on top of the long-term problems, Brexit with its trade frictions, uh, difficulty in migration from Europe to the UK, it's going to add more economic problems. And it's worth pointing out that the UK historically has been a country that's relied very much on trade. It's been an important factor behind our high growth rates and high living standards. But in recent years, this has started to fall. And with Brexit, it could be hit further. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that you could say the decline in the UK economy is not something entirely new. The UK economy was the first to industrialise. At one time in the 19th century, it was the biggest economy in the world. In 1870, around a quarter of the global manufacturing output was in the UK. But given the size of the country, it's only natural that over the years this should decline. And the UK has steadily fallen down the list of biggest economies in the world from first to around eighth now, recently been overtaken by India. So whilst we produced a quarter of global manufacturing output in 1870, by 1938 that had fallen to 10% and by 1973 that had fallen to 4.9%. I don't actually know the figure for 2022, but I imagine it's really very small. Also, if we look at the value of a pound in the past 100 years, you can see there's been a steady decline. It's hard to imagine that there was a time when one pound was worth four and a half US dollars. And the long-term decline in the pound 
represents the fact that the UK economy has become less competitive over the years. We've had higher inflation, lower productivity, and so this reflects why the pound has fallen in value. Also, I will mention the recent budget, which again I've covered in more detail in another video, but the humiliating U-turn over trisonomics, I think is important because it's uh, something that captured the imagination of the world. You know, the UK in difficulty both politically and economically. And this does undermine Britain's credibility to some extent. It's made the UK bond market more wary about investors. It's put more pressure on another round of austerity. And so the UK is not as attractive place to invest as it used to be. With all the negative uh, coverage surrounding Brexit and the UK's relative decline, firms are becoming reluctant to invest in the UK because why would they outside the single market when they could invest directly into the single market and avoid, avoid all the frictions and customs unions? But is the long-term decline of the UK inevitable? Well, nothing is inevitable in economics and there's always a chance for renewal, but it would take quite deep-seated change in both government policy, but also uh, business policy. And it would need a climate of long-term investment in education, new green technologies, and the automated technology that will enable the UK to improve productivity. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you do like it, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't seen it already, I do recommend this video on the costs of Brexit, which go into more detail on the recent decline in the UK. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and I hope to have more great videos on economics soon. Okay, thank you. Bye.